uh, I want to thank you very much for taking us on this journey to the future and to Barcelona as well. Okay. Very nice. <laughs> we enjoyed that. And I also want to thank you for clarifying why our children do the way they do. We thought they're abnormal, but no, we understand now that our children are just fine. They're just like everybody else. <laughs> so I'm not going to complain anymore, and I think many of us should do this too. Uh, really, uh, Wim, I think uh, this is a, one of those times where I think we, I do believe that there is substance. There is a lot of hype sometimes into many topics that come hyped up. And I think today is one of those topics that are really very encompassing and, and so on. I was going to ask you just one question, because I'm sure others probably will have more questions than me, and they're more entitled to it than me. The Internet of Things and the Internet of Everything. I think you touched on that, but if you clarify that once and for all, maybe for us initially, and if you also would share with us a little bit about your, your, your project or your World Forum project on this matter, I'd, I'd appreciate that for the audience. Thank you. Thanks for your kind words and uh, thanks for having me here. And the Internet of Things is all about the connectivity, the things. The Internet of Everything is that concept of the infrastructure, the things but then taking in account the data and the processes and how you're going to transform them. And so the Internet of Things, one component like mobility, like cloud, a technology, but a technology at the moment that is essential to get that whole Internet of everything going. Great. Okay. I'll open the floor now. I'm sure many of you have questions for our guests. And, uh, I'll start with an in-house question, I would say. Fadi. Thank you for a uh, yeah, very interesting talk. Um, I'm Fadi Sad, and I have a research program on governance and innovation, and here is a question on how the Russian School of Government. And um, seven years ago, we also hosted um, Mr. John Chambers, CEO of Cisco, in the same room, the same, uh, sitting in the same seat. And I then remember asking him a question about the productivity paradox that appears from um, investing heavily in technology but not receiving the expected outcome of it. Now, with the development of smart cities today, uh, that is driven and uh, fueled by data, um, there are enormous impact or uh, expensive expected work for the managing of the data, legally, financially, technologically, but less talked about is the social impact of this enormous amount of data that is going to be created and how it's going to be managed and what implications financially and economically are there for that. So are we in the future expecting to see another kind of paradox, a data-driven productivity paradox where a huge amount of data is continuously produced, but the implications of it, of managing it, Misusing it in society, in this market, could be affecting productivity somehow. Thank you. Thank you for the question. You know that there's so many topics that I could go into. First, I acknowledge, and um, at really um, at your question uh, seven years ago, and that John and I we co-lead this whole initiative in the company of the Internet of Everything. And he said, Wim, whatever we're going to do, and he said it three years ago to me, and we have to be able to prove the economic value, outcome-based. So he listened. <laughs> and then you've seen that. And we're basically going from technology to services to solution to outcome-based. Because that is what CEOs want. And that is what government leaders want. That These are my top three problems, challenges. What can you do for me? And so you have to be like Hamburg, how can you give them 60% productivity improvement? And so that's one element. And the other thing is, uh, from a social point of view, um, and this is going to be uh, one of these other big transformations. Uh, and it's going faster and it's accelerated. And like I said, if I see how my kids at work live, play and learn, um, I have to be careful that I'm not going to be the old man who doesn't understand it. And I'm in the middle. Um, but the positive message, I think, is that 19 trillion of opportunity. And that we can break down, and that we can start analyzing. And it, it, it's going to be an, an enormous transformation for the workforce. And let's, that, like I said, the economist, 40% of jobs are going to disappear. 
and, and the more you are in a process job, the bigger chance. Yeah, but I have a provisional crown at the moment yeah, from my dentist. It was printed on a 3D printer. Think about it. Yeah, that 10 years from now, yeah, that uh, 400,000 less dental workers. Yeah, that if you get um, a 3D printing, 20% of supply and demand of goods will disappear on the world. Yeah, but let's focus on the new jobs that it creates. And that's what it can do. And that we still have a billion people who have no access to healthcare and education. And that if we go to a more sharing economy, and that we can have the, I would say, rural benefits um, shared with the urban benefits that are over. So I'm, I'm at the moment in, in, in India, we're doing master planning, master ICT planning for five new cities at the Delhi-Mumbai corridor. And we really start now with the question, shall we first build a road or shall we first build connectivity? And young kids can build apps from every place in the world. So is the next Bill Gates coming somewhere out of a developing country in a rural area? The social impacts will be huge. And we should probably start facing and be more respectful on privacy, on security, on cyber. That we have to start learning how to handle this and come up with, like I call, manifests. And so we could sit here for hours, and I would love to have that type of discussions. But for me, the three things are really, one, yes, it is outcome-based. Secondly, it's very positive. It creates new value. And thirdly, um, if we anticipate and be adaptive and agile, it can improve the way the work lives, plays, learns. Thank you. Ranem, then. Hello, Hi. Uh, very interesting speech. Uh, for me, I have several questions because we are going through now, the body is going through the smart city project. We want to be the smartest within three years. And uh, I'm from Silicon Oasis. It's a technology hub in Dubai. And we uh, recently announced a smart city project. Uh, the project would be uh, around 1.1 billion. Half of that price would be for smart solution. So it's not just the construction. Uh, so in order to reach to the wisdom area of your pyramid there, but I assume that it will take several years to reach there also. Uh, isn't it uh, going to take us to the next era of we don't worry about the integration that's happening between the internet of everything? So uh, it should ease our life, and they shouldn't be worried about registering cars, registering all this, and will reduce the stress on us. So that's the ambition. That's what we are seeking for, going forward. Then, New living. I think Europe is moving toward that one where they reduce working hours. They want less disease, less stress, less hospital uh, challenges there. So, how we can have a lead to reach to that? I mean, you already included the same the regulation. And, uh, we, we think that the attention now is focusing on the infrastructure and the technology, but not on the process. And that's what we are facing here now. I mean, what I heard was all about technology, um, a city that is, I mean, if, it, if it's like this, all cities are smart, because they already have some sort of technology. But to us, we're looking, I, I, I can give an example, uh, the way that we're looking at it in, uh, in the BSO, that we will have a community farm, hmm. that people can really use this for farming their own uh, uh, crops, and, hmm. and that would take them away from the technology. And it's a free, by the way, a free farm for anybody who's dealing with this. So, yeah, yeah we, need jump, uh, we need to jump yeah. a little bit higher than really talking about technology on. I, I couldn't agree more. I had a, in my opening, I said it's not about what the technology is, it's about what the technology enables. I, I think what, what really is going to be the, the biggest competition between smart cities is how to governance the potential, the innovation. Hey, because on one hand, decentralization is fantastic, hey, but a lot of these concepts need a common type of infrastructure. And so how can you find the balance between decentralization and letting go 
on the other side, yeah, that's coming up. And I think that is what Barcelona has mastered so far, yeah, is where they have a weekly meeting uh, that between the different constituents uh, in the governance of the city to prioritize, to say, hey, if we have a project with water management, why not at the same moment we do then this or we do that? Or, and then experiment. Uh, that really uh, that create live-in labs. Uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that you get the citizens involved, and you can unleash that potential. Um, that, that, that is for me going to be probably, uh, that to make it human. <laughs> it is that, that, that economic, social, and environmental. Uh, but cities need a soul and need a place where people feel comfortable, and uh, feel respected, feel safe, a safe place. And so I still think out of my five elements of thought leadership, public-private partnerships, global open standards, uh, that public-private, the governance, uh, that's, you know, like, like let, let, let's face it, the, the power of Dubai has been that enormous acceleration of speed. And, uh, that's, uh, but I, I think there will be at least 40 or 60 constituents competing for who's the smartest. Uh, that, that how can you bundle that energy uh, and, and keep that, that, that focus on uh, what is vertical and what is horizontal? And I, I, I don't have the answer. I have probably as many questions as you have. But doing it, and it, instead of trying to think serial, that one after the other, I start thinking in parallel. How can you do things synchronized? That how can a governance body become more an orchestrator? I think that, that are going to be the buzzwords to enable these enormous opportunities. I have a simple question. You talk about the future infrastructure. Whether, whether we need to invest in the uh, wired or wireless infrastructure for the Internet of Things? Both. You know, that's in, in the ground, that because the, the amount of data and volumes are so big uh, that, that you need a backhole in the ground, fiber, whatever, and you need cell, uh, uh, LTE, we talk about 4G, think in 10G, uh, but think in Wi Fi, uh, because that's where you can mesh up. A bit both. And then it will be seamless. And it will be, you know, from a user point of view, a one infrastructure. Professor Jones, and then. Thank you very much for a really enjoyable presentation. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my name is Christopher Jones, I'm from the Ministry of Higher Education in Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that you mentioned was this idea of global open standards and smart regulation. I wonder if you could just expand on that slightly because there is uh, a need to, to be inclusive and not exclusive in, in terms of any sort of smart city development. And, and especially when it comes to what is the aging demographic. And you, like I, have the experience of two children who <laughs> you know, sleep or sit in front of a computer. So they have a different perspective, we have a different perspective. How will it all mix mm -hmm. in? How will it become a global phenomenon? Yeah, global open standards are an absolute necessity. And you see also, if you look at opportunities for smart, because we call smart everything nowadays, that, 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 um, it, it, it's amazing. And that the public sector is really leading with smart cities. It's probably, uh, and don't take this wrongly, but the first time in history that public sector is leading an industry. It's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, but um, if you look in the different utilities, um, uh, that, uh, we, we talk about smart grid. Um, uh, but that, that's lagging uh, because a lot of these industries are still closed, uh, are heavily regulated. Uh, you come to the discussions, we've, uh, that, that if I come in from an, a technology company, what do you know we do this for 100 years? You, you, you get all these sentences that you know that this is not going to work. Uh, that it, it, it has to go worse before it comes up. And so my point in, on, on smart uh, standards uh, is why is cell phone telephony so popular? Because you can use it everywhere in the world. And that we have gone to a couple of standards. And so when we started working on internet protocols 30 years ago, uh, we had 80 protocols. And nowadays we have three or five. Uh, smart grid still has 286. Uh, we're just scratching the surface. Healthcare, overregulated. And that's so... It is an absolute impediment that we have to tackle as an industry and uh, that we organize in the, uh, what we call Internet of Things World Forum to talk about these standards, 
but then also about policies. And that, that was your second question. And so my advice on, on policy management, you know, invite your kid, children. Let them attend the meetings. And let them just give you a reaction and you will be amazed. I like that. <laughs> Mr. Ahmad, please. Thank you so much for your uh, very interesting talk. Actually, more and more I think about this, but it's really very complex issues. I think it's really driving or considering from different people, different, different people, different levels, social, economic, uh, education, everything. Uh, so, and, and from your experience, as you exposed to different uh, experiences in this smart city transformation, so that thing. What would be a typical roadmap for transformation? Is it a decision from the authority, from the government, from the municipality, or is it really social decision? And not just the start of it, but how really a good, you say, map will go forward in an effective and efficient manner? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, the point is there has to be a roadmap. Um, the starting point, however, can be dramatically different, depending on the state of the city. Like I said, Detroit's bankrupt. And so it's an urgency to get an economic activity going. Um, if you go to Mumbai, it's all about the slums and about pollution. If you go to Rio, it's all about the Valafas, that how do you bring education and health care uh, to the underprivileged if you are starting to organize the... Um, the Olympic Games. Yeah, that, that, uh, so I think it needs a visionary plan uh, that for five to ten years. Um, a bit the roadmap, and uh, that's different type of chapters. Uh, but the content has to be extremely local. Uh, that where do you start from? And what are the three top issues that you have to solve? I, I want to leave it there. <laughs> yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Imad Khatib. I'm a partner of Atlas, and um, we're an advisory company. And what we do is basically from the relationship with what you have promoted. Um, however, there is only a question that trickles down to in people's mind. If I'm going to do connect to the internet, I have my own apps, app store, whatever you want. We'll, we're growing this by multiplications of factors. But there is one thing a lot of the users still get to get an answer for, which is security. Where is that is going to play an impact? And we need to do a design for a smart city. And I believe Cisco apparently have participated in Barcelona's uh, smart city concept. And they help them out grow into a true smart city. Where does this see itself better within that space of assuring people that their apps are secure? We know that the most intrusive application or the most intrusive usage is Facebook. It gets into your device, and then hackers and whatever you want to call it is there. So you become a truly that personal security has been stripped out of your privacy. Therefore, it has impacted your social life or social behavior because you feel you have been threatened because of violation of security. It doesn't have to be a physical security. Now we're talking about the internet security. Yeah. I do you see this? Where yeah, no, no, that's um, as, as one of the biggest impedience that can slow down the acceptance of the concept I was just talking about. And the worst thing is that you then lose that opportunity of 19 trillion economic value. And so I'm absolutely not in denial. I'm not defensive. Security, and I can't talk for other companies, but as an industry, has to get much more attention. And then specifically via the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, you get a concentration. Because a lot of business processes are not secure anyway. Uh, but the moment you start concentrating it, uh, the vulnerability becomes bigger. And so number one is acknowledge it. If you acknowledge a problem, then you have solved it for 50%. Uh, 
Eh, because then you start organizing energy eh, to go to solutions instead of trying to deny it or eh, be um, patronizing the issues. Um, so industry initiatives, global open standards, uh, also there are absolutely required. Um, and I think as an industry, we have three to five years had to come up with the right type of concept. Otherwise, our customers will start saying, we don't like this, and it will stop. Actually, I'd like to share this with you. Not very long ago, I attended a very specialized topic on this matter, and the keynote speaker made an announcement, and he said, I'd like everybody to know that privacy is dead and security is in the ICU. <laughs> and I think we have to accept this. And I think it makes a lot of sense when we think and, and, and do about it now. But I'd also like to bring attention to, to a big event that, uh, I mean, clearly Cisco has been involved, but Mr. Elfring personally has had another. I'm going to refer to your World Forum, mm -hmm. which is taking place in Chicago. And if you don't mind sharing this with, with, with everybody, so at least it shows how far ahead into that pyramid, you know, visionaries are still yeah, working. So it's uh, the first, uh, what we call, in Internet of Things World Forum uh, took place in Barcelona. Uh, that's 18 months ago, and as you can see, Barcelona has done something good with it. And they already had done 10 years of work. Eh? That's so um, and the objective of, uh, it, it's an industry initiative uh, between, at this moment, uh, 24 companies, and uh, Oracle, Intel, Qualcomm, IBM, um, and that's SAP, uh, that's Honeywell, Schneider, and it's, I'm not doing right to all of them, but that's the risk. You know, I, I can give you the white paper, the website. And so we try to look at, um, at it, the industry as such. And that's where we talk about more the horizontal type of topics. And so what are the standard bodies? Do we have enough? What should we further subsidize or uh, create funds for? Privacy, security, regulation, smart regulation are all kinds of topics. Um, at this moment, it's an uh, by invitation only seminar. Um, and it's, uh, we started with 700 in Barcelona, every this year in Chicago. And we also show then in Chicago uh, what our um, smart solutions in the city are, uh, to get feedback from uh, that, uh, the, the audience. Um, and uh, we're currently in the process of deciding next year and it's exciting to say that uh, Dubai is one of the big runner-ups. And uh, that in the next uh, two to four weeks, we have to take a decision. And uh, it's good that there is a lot of competition. I hope the audience will qualify for an invitation because it's a by invitation only event. So, so far. if we do it here, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. At the beginning, you have touched on the, the population around the world, hmm. democracies. Yeah. We have seen few countries with declining in their population, mm -hmm. and some with aging population, and some with rapidly growing populations like the UAE, I mean, yeah. that's one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of smart, smart cities, smart you know, mm -hmm. technology, don't you need smart users as well? Mm -hmm. I mean, in order to, I'm talking about adoption of such. Adoption. So where this would start with? Keeping in mind that you know, aging people might be resistant to, to change, right? Mm -hmm. And is it that we have to wait for the new generation so who, who, who open mm -hmm. their eyes to seeing the technology? Mm -hmm. A lot of elements in your question. Let me uh, focus on two. Uh, so the first one, um, and you know, I always like to personalize my stories, and either I talk about my kids or I talk about my mother-in-law. I haven't done that yet, so let me introduce her here and now. Um, she's 81 years old, and uh, that's uh, when I, uh, I asked uh, her daughter to be married with me, and she said, what are you doing? And I said, you know, I work for a company, Cisco, and she said, can you give her a real good future? What is the company doing? And I said, hey, we are changing the way we work, live, play, and learn. And, and then she looked at me like mothers-in-law can do, and, you know... <laughs> You know, so we live in California. She still lives in the Netherlands. She Skypes with the kids at, at least three times a week. Um, and she uses technology pervasively. 
I, I think the biggest resistance is in the, in, in the middle age type of groups. And more and more seniors with healthcare. So the point I tried to make is that if you make it relevant to your audience, people will start using it. And I don't believe so much in these age-related defense systems. Um, it is, you know, uh, how you make it relevant for the different groups. And uh, that, that's one. Uh, the, the other one, uh, adaptation is rational experimentation. Uh, that uh, the Cornish that, that, that Dubai is developing now, showcases. Uh, we are involved in a lot of pilot projects in the world uh, where people show the population what it is. Uh, that's, I always ask mayors nowadays, uh, and I, I warn them up front, if we have press in the audience, that they know that the question is coming, uh, which apps do you use most? And when I asked the mayor in, uh, in Chicago, uh, it, it was the vice mayor, sorry. Uh, that, that was in, in January, and he said, the app I use most is the snow shuffle. If we have, you, you can't imagine here, uh, but if you have a city with snow <laughs> in the middle of the winter, and you want to go to your work or your school or whatever you do in the morning, uh, you look at that app, which roads are going to be cleaned first. And uh, so the, the point I try to make is uh, relevance is extremely important. And uh, it's uh, participative democracy, get citizens involved. Uh, New York is spending $200 million a year uh, to just control whether all lights are on and if things work. And it's, you know, in the second phase of the internet, and we went to self-management, book your own tickets. Do, if you have an integrated operation center in your city, citizens would love to report what they see if they believe that there is a follow-up. And so for New York, there's $200 million value at stake and by just having an integrated operation center and where you can report that this or that light pole is down or that the garbage has not been collected. It is so easy to involve people, and I think get citizens involved and participating and starting to generate ideas and come with recommendations, then you create relevance. Forgive me, we have room for one very quick question from Dr. Abdullah Shamsi in the back. Professor Abdullah Tfadal, uh, please. We are talking about networks, and uh, we never call the city smart city when we created the, the, the network of roads, for example. We never call it. The city is smart when we use the machine. Uh, using the word, the current problem is more and more appropriate than using the word uh, smart cities. And this is, a, this is a, I think, is a fundamental problem. Because when we talk about smart cities and we talk about electronics and internet things, we are actually talking about horizontal development of things here. Nowadays, the actual creation of, I mean, you create a lot of data that's correct. But how much of that data is actual genuine and new knowledge that we are creating at the moment? The amount of emphasis that we are putting at the moment on the internet of things and on the creation of data has some kind of negative uh, influence on the invention of new things. I'm talking about pure sciences and pure, pure mathematics and so on. And on, on in the future, with, with the downturn of new inventions, of new knowledge, of new general knowledge, cities could be, relatively speaking, less smart than it is actually. I think you, you just add an, an additional element to the overall discussion. Um, and it's, uh, I follow the flow, and I think smart at the moment is the brand. Um, and there will be a moment that another brand will take over. Um, and it, let's see how that evolves. Um, I hear what you say. And, and it's every uh, new element um, in society comes with um, benefits, with impedience, with risks. Um, I think what, what you bring up, uh, is why I think uh, that uh, the participation between the academic, public, and private worlds is so important, and uh, that we always have that discussion to find the balance. And you know, I stimulate, and uh, you know, I'm running out of time uh, to have these type of debates, and uh, that that's one of the roles that an academic world should play: challenges, keep.
keep us, you know, focused and warn us for hypeness. Let me leave it there. Thank you. And I do apologize because uh, Mr. Elfrink has a previous commitment and we are trying, but I will only release him if he promises to come again and spend more time with us. And I think this he will agree to now because I'm in a strong position not to close this. So he'll probably agree to come again soon and maybe we can have uh, a living lab or some sort of a, of a, of a, of a lab uh, you know, discussion with, with, with mentors and things that bring everybody else. Again, I would like to first of all thank you all for being here today. I want to thank uh, Mr. Amr Salem in particular who made this possible for us. Thank you very much, Amr. I want to thank clearly the speaker who has enriched our Thursday morning with, uh, with a lot of things. I think it will take more than a weekend to, to lose the effect of your uh, presentation, I think, of course, really. And I want to thank the team at uh, the Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government who made this possible for all of us. And I would like to think that we will soon welcome you again, hopefully, on, on, on another or a continuation of, of this interesting stream of things. Thank you very much and have a good day and a good weekend. Thank you. Too. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Really. It's Thank been you. A pleasure.